We're here today to talk about jealousy. You know the concept, subject of ancient myths and modern movies, a powerful and exciting human experience that taps into our relationship with love and sex and partnership, our needs and our desires, our drive for mutual connection, and our sense of what it means to be an independent and separate individual. Exciting though it may be, jealousy is also a form of suffering. And suffering, as a general rule, is not only undesirable, but entirely unnecessary. Luckily, it's possible to end jealousy in a short period of time. Now, I don't just mean incrementally develop your ability to tolerate it so you can handle it, or work on it bit by bit so it gradually decreases. I mean, in a short period of time, it's possible to shift your relationship with what jealousy is such that it becomes unrecognizable or ceases to exist. This is going to be the first part of a six-part series on ending jealousy permanently. And today I'd like to share with you a few foundational concepts that will allow you to hack into the process by which you convert pain into suffering. These concepts will allow you to start to shift your relationship with something that happens automatically on its own that you may never have investigated or questioned. The first of these concepts is that we organize our experience. No matter what's happening, you are doing the job of actively organizing your experience of it. So for instance, if you walk in on two people who are having uh, an entrenched argument with each other, how you experience what's happening depends on a number of things. Let's say, for instance, that you're affiliated with one of those people. You're close with them and you're able to see the other person as an adversary. Well, you'll probably take one person's side. You'll see things from that person's perspective because organizing experience partially means that you focus on certain things and not on other things. And that changes the entire experience. But beyond what you focus on and attend to and what you don't attend to, there's a layer of meaning that you apply to what's happening. So the kind of meaning that you might apply could be that the person that you're affiliated with, um, you want them to win. And an argument is about two people who are both trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong. And so you might be listening for evidence for rightness and wrongness. If on the other hand, you're trained in something like nonviolent communication or other kinds of mediation work, you might listen to two people doing a, perhaps a really clumsy job of trying to express their needs to each other. And so instead, you might listen for the unmet needs that people are grappling to find a way to articulate and express to one another. What you can do in that situation is entirely dependent on how you make sense of the experience, how you organize your relationship to it. If you can hear people's needs, you can help them learn to express them in a clearer way that actually might create a kind of resolution as opposed to just creating a competition. So organizing your experience is something you're always doing. And if you're experiencing something that you're calling jealousy, it means that you have, without knowing it, learned to organize all the things that are happening to you in a particular way that produces suffering that you don't want. So we're looking at how to reorganize our experience such that jealousy is no longer the outcome. The second concept that's important to understand here as a foundation is the difference between pain and suffering. Pain is a natural response to life as it's happening, and it's entirely unavoidable. If someone you're close to dies, for instance, you will grieve, you will feel sadness, you will experience loss. It's inevitable and it's the right way to respond to someone dying. If on the other hand, you have some meaning that you apply to it, like for instance, if you think that the person died because God is punishing you and this kind of thing always happens to you, or you blame yourself because you didn't love them enough or because you weren't there to help them in the moment that if you had been, maybe they wouldn't have died. Or maybe you don't blame yourself or think that God is punishing you, but you think it's a problem that you are continuing to grieve for as long as you are, so you shut it down thinking this shouldn't be such a big deal, I shouldn't be feeling so much. And if you have any of those kinds of meanings that you apply to the experience, you'll stop being able to fully and honestly grieve. Pain is feelings in motion. Suffering is what happens when feelings and pain in particular get trapped behind a wall of meaning. Suffering is feelings trapped behind a wall of meaning. And so figuring out how to get at the meanings that you're creating 
and dismantle them can allow those feelings to start to flow again, to move so that you can get to the end of, for instance, a grieving process and have something like healing or growth happen on the other side. Jealousy is a form of suffering because it's not actually a feeling. You may think jealousy is a feeling, but as you investigate it, you'll find out that jealousy is any number of feelings with a layer of meaning added that creates the experience of suffering that we call jealousy. The third concept here, and perhaps the most important for our purposes today, is the idea that naming is framing. So you've got this word, jealousy, and you use it to apply to certain kinds of experiences that you have. And in using that word, you put a frame around those experiences. Now, I'm talking to you within a frame, right? You can see certain things because they're in the frame, and you can't see other things because they're outside of the frame. That's what framing does. It highlights certain aspects of your experience and marginalizes or disregards other aspects of your experience. So when you use the word jealousy, you are somehow freezing in place your experience and paying attention to only the things that exist within the frame of the word jealousy. So now, here is your first permanently moment. There are three moments, I'll warn you when they're about to happen, and each of them is a moment at which your relationship with jealousy can be permanently altered. You have the possibility here, um, and in these other two moments if you miss this one, of changing forever your relationship with the word jealousy. And it goes like this. Stop using the word jealousy. If you stop using the word jealousy, something different is going to happen. And this is not just a trick. Language is powerful. Language creates meaning, and meaning creates experience. If you don't have the word jealousy to use, you will no longer be experiencing jealousy. Something else will happen. In particular, you'll be required to start to really pay attention to what's going on when you remove the frame from the experience. What's actually happening? And it turns out that you can't really do much with jealousy. It's kind of a stuck experience. But all the things that are happening when you take the cap off and remove the frame and look at what's going on underneath, you can do something with all of that. And so it's possible to allow pain to get in motion again, for things to change and move instead of remain trapped. In our next video, we're going to be looking at just that. What is it that is actually happening when you remove the word jealousy? Eventually, we'll have to figure out what do you do to talk about this experience without the word. It's like, uh, remember when the musician Prince decided to change his name to this cool little squiggly symbol, but nobody could pronounce that symbol, so he just became the artist formerly known as Prince? It was just a replacement name. It's just another name. We don't want to be talking about the experience formerly known as jealousy. We want to be talking about something else entirely. And finding out what that is will be the subject of part two.